Okay, everybody here. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. I just went into this meeting the last second. Yes, today I'm, I'm very happy to introduce our today's guest speaker, Monica Brandis, to you. We just talked about it. It's Monica Brandis or Monica Brandis, <laughs> whichever culture we are in. Um, so I, I speak English now, so I call her Monica Brand Brandis, holds a master's degree uh, in American studies, um, history and journalism from the Free University of Berlin. And she's a journalist, a writer, a contract lecturer at the Free University of oh. Bolzano, um, a lecturer at Pestalozzi für Rübelhaus in Berlin and a Gestalt um, therapist. I don't know how to translate that. Um, she was born in San Francisco and has lived in the United States, in Germany, in France, Italy and Ireland. So she's very uh, a cosmopolitan. And for a while now, she has made Berlin her home. Now, Monica Brandis has undertaken research into the history of the children from Operation Shamrock, which marks a period of intense Irish-German collaboration as Irish families gave refugee and respite to hundreds of German children in the aftermath of World War II. She has exhibited the outcomes of this project in many places around the world and also in Germany. Now, during a Heinrich Böll writer's residency on Akil Island, she wrote 18 short stories about selected incidents in the life of each of the children from Operation Shamrock. From the child's point of view, making the experience more tangible. When she lived in Ireland, she hosted the Mo show on Irish Radio International, where she interviewed people who were at home somewhere between Ireland and Germany, such as former ambassador Eckhard Lückemeyer, future consultant Una strathern horks journalist Don Morgan, and Dr. Manfred Schewe, head of the drama and German department at UCC at the time. And the letter is very well known to us here in Würzburg because he was a guest lecturer last summer. <clears throat> now, Monica, we are very happy to have you here today and we are all very much looking forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maria, for introducing me in this very favorable uh, way. Will I uh, open my screen now? Is this the mm -hmm. moment? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you all for being here and uh, showing an interest in Operation Shamrock and uh, the stories of its protagonists. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professors Bergman and Eisenman for inviting me. I will briefly outline what's going to happen. Can you all see me yes, and mm -hmm. the PowerPoint? Great, perfect. Great, so, great. everything. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Um, first, I will give some background information on Operation Shamrock in general. Then I will explain how my research got started. In the next step, I will analyze factors that contributed to the quality of, of the stay of the children in Ireland. I will then discuss the long-term effects of that exchange program, so to speak, and from the 20 plus participants that I've interviewed uh, in the past. I have chosen four about whose lives I will tell you a bit more. This is going to be Klaus, who I call the stray dog. In fact, he calls himself the stray dog. Agnes, the perfect child. Hans-Peter, the abandoned child. And Elizabeth, the Irish success. Um, you can see them all on the first uh, um, yeah, page here. I will then go on to contrast the impressions of the participants of the time witnesses with the memories of their foster siblings and friends who I had the pleasure to interview uh, a year ago, about a year ago. Um, then conclude with a short story, one of the ones I wrote, and uh, 
afterwards, I hope we will have time for a lively discussion. And I think it's completely okay if you ask questions after each part, so this doesn't become a one woman show altogether. Okay, so in 1946, 47, 450 German children from North Rhine-Westphalia were taken in by Irish families for a period of about three years. Several stayed for a la longer period of time and about 50 of those made their home in Ireland altogether. Why um, did the children all come from North Rhine-Westphalia? Um, well, it was a Catholic region and Ireland is a very Catholic country. So there were pre-war ties uh, between the, um, the, the two regions. And also, of course, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia was the British zone. And uh, the permission of the British allies had to be obtained before the children were allowed to be taken out of the country. Um, interestingly enough, there is no complete list of all the children who were taken to Ireland. I have found partial lists in the archives, but there is no complete list, which is so astonishing because the Germans were such orderly people. Um, yeah, I mean, great list makers, right? And so I don't know at this point whether there was never a general list in general or whether maybe it was destroyed at some point. Further research might shed light on this question. And also interestingly enough, there's a lot of gratefulness for the Irish uh, people who took on these people, the, the young Germans. Um, but the first transports could not be filled when after this whole process, permission had been obtained to take the children to Ireland. Um, German families were hesitant. Some, some still had memories of wartime Germany where the children were sent uh, to safe zones and sometimes did, had not reappeared, uh, were vanished altogether. And in the beginning, it was also um, planned that the German children would stay in Ireland forever and become Irish citizens. And the German parents did not want that. Only when the period was reduced to three years um, were they able to fill the transports. Of course, there were also a lot of orphans involved in the Operation Shamrock. And with them, it was a completely different story. Um, Operation Shamrock was initiated by a pediatrician, a Dublin pediatrician called Kathleen Murphy and her Save the German Children's Society. It was humanitarian in nature, but um, it was also pro-German. Germany and Ireland, as you all know, have a, have a history. <laughs> um, a common enemy sometimes makes friends out of people. And so some of the members of the G Save the German Children Society even were Nazis. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, infamous German spy, Hermann Goetz, uh, served as the society's secretary. And at some funerals, people were wearing swastikas and you know, uh, doing the Hitler reading. And sources also kind of vary on the age of the children, but the majority was between five and 10 years old at the time when they were taken to Ireland. It was stipulated that 80% had to be Catholic and 20% had to be Protestant. Uh, interestingly enough, Jewish children were not allowed to be taken uh, to Ireland. One of the reasons is that there were Jewish organizations taking care of Jewish children. There was one organization which also brought Jewish uh, children to Ireland in the aftermath of the war. But Operation Shamrock said this would be too much of a cultural shock for the Jewish children 
to be brought into Irish families. Once again, I think Ireland wasn't necessarily a very pro-Jewish country at the moment at that time, so other sentiments might have also played a part. For the uh, German parents, I think, as I mentioned already, it was a very difficult um, decision whether to have their children with them in war after, you know, in that Germany after the war where there was hunger, where there was a lack of fuel, where there was a lot of disease going around or whether to send them to a foreign country, a country that at least emotionally was connected to their former war enemy, the UK, and the children did not speak English uh, as a rule of thumb. And nobody knew if keeping in touch would be a possibility. Some parents even had to face the question, which of their children to send to Ireland? Um, when the children were first brought to Ireland, they stayed in Glen Cree or in Castle Bellingham. And then the, uh, the parents, the Irish parents willing to take in children would go there and actually pick a child. And from some of the, re the interviews, um, I know that uh, especially the blue eyed, the blonde kids were taken in first, the teeth were checked. It was a picking process, selection process that would not happen this way anymore. Also, the families weren't really vetted. So you had lots of different families who took in kids, but even some bachelors took in kids. Um, the, the problem with that was that nobody really, in a systematic way, kept track of the children who were living with Irish families or single people for that matter, or, or old couples who had no children. And in the few cases where bad things did happen and bad things, I mean, beatings, uh, even sexual molestation in one case, nobody was there to pr protect these children. But this is the, the exception. I think most of them, uh, for them, Ireland was a lifesaver and they're very grateful for the opportunity. Um, equally dramatic, uh, the, the, the situation was equally dramatic when it was time for the German children to go back to Germany. Most of them had forgotten their German. Some wanted to stay in Ireland. They didn't want to go back. They had not always kept in touch with their parents. The Irish parents also did not want them to leave in some cases. And so uh, I know of where the child wanted to stay in Ireland. The parents, the German parents insisted the child be returned home. And then they put the child in the orphanage because it didn't speak any German anymore and felt like a stranger to the family, which is pretty harsh, I would say. Um, yeah, so this was a brief overview of Operation Shamrock in, in general. Any questions at this point? Okay. Lots of information to process, right? Um, the, I, my research got started when I was living in Ireland. And uh, the German ambassador said, there's the gathering of children in Glen Cree, the gathering of the children of Operation uh, Shamrock. That was in 2013. You should go there, it will be interesting. And I went there and I was fascinated. I, I heard these stories and I thought these stories have to be uh, preserved for posterity. These people are already really old and their stories need to be told. So I obtained funding 
and I started to interview them. Of the 450 children, I have interviewed 22 so far. Some have passed on already, unfortunately. But um, interestingly enough, new ones keep on showing up. I have two new prospects in Ireland. One lady who was uh, taken into a, um, into a gal tuft. So she never even grew up in, in English speaking Ireland. Um, Irish became her first language and another lady who lives near Cork. So I look forward to talking to them. Um, yeah, and since then, oh, I keep, I, I, I forget to show you pictures. See, I get so carried away. Uh, let's hold on. See, this is um, one of the, this, yeah, I'll give you time to read it. And especially the sentence, die Kinder stehen von dort aus ohne jegliche Beschränkung im Postverkehr mit der Heimat. Um, that that's a big promise because first of all it was 1946 i think the postal service was not a hundred percent functioning at that time plus it, it was in the hands of the families of they made if they made sure that the child had contact with their german family and some of them were dirt poor just sending just sending a letter would have been a sizable expense for a family at the time um yeah um, yeah this is uh uh in in köln the heinrich Böll stiftung uh, invited uh, two witnesses to the left that's uh, herbert remmel to the right that's klaus armstrong brown and me uh, to, to Cologne to show the exhibition. My research was turned into an exhibition, I should say. And this exhibition has met with a lot of interest from German Irish societies in, in uh, Germany, such as the Society in Würzburg and in Bonn, um, but also some other cultural institutions. So let me... Gone. Yeah, it's been shown in about 10 places so far. Um, I will continue talking and is there are any questions at this point? Okay, you get to take a look at the faces of the protagonists at of Operation Shamrock while I go on talking. You will see that all the interviews are structured in, in the same way, because at first I had, I was, um, these were open interviews and people had so much information to share. And I realized I had to find a format that made the information kind of comparable. So I've always asked for their profession, for the Irish family they lived in, about, I asked about their life in Germany, I asked how they got in touch with Operation Shamrock, they or, or their families, how their lives went on in Ireland, what they thought about Operation Shamrock in general. And I also asked about their life philosophy and whether they felt more Irish or more German. And I will share the results with you later on. And I will have a sip of tea in the meantime. Um, the circumstances that the children encountered in Ireland were very different. As I mentioned before, there was a wide, of, wide selection of people who took these children in. So you had spinsters, you had bachelors, you had families that had 10 children of their own. And some of the factors that uh, influenced the quality of the stay of the German children was the economic status of the family they, um, they arrived in. Some families were really rich. Uh, one family had a private tennis court. The children were taken, they were giving horseback riding lessons, piano lessons, French lessons. But others lived in the countryside. And I'm talking no running water at that time in Ireland in some places. 
even children who had lived through a war said, this is a poverty we didn't know from, you know, from uh, living in Germany. There was, a, it was a mud floor and the, the pig would be taken in if it was about to give birth. And everybody, this was the living room of the family. So that was a major influence. Um, also, an influence was the family's place of residence, uh, which is also tied into the economic status to a certain degree, made a very big difference if you lived in a remote place in the country or if you lived in the city. For one, the reason, the difference being that um, the children that stayed in the city had a much easier time keeping in touch with their siblings as often siblings were separated, unfortunately, and perhaps also other German children, whereas some of the children who lived in the countryside were pretty much on their own. Um, I remember one of my interviewees, he said uh, he was sent to school, he had to go to school, but afterwards he had to return to the farm to help out. So he, there, and it was um, a, an old couple, so he was never around other children except in school. And he never had any, he never made any real Irish friends. He was, he never integrated into the society, um, which did not feel good to him, especially since he had come out of a very big family in Germany. He wasn't used to being the only child in a family. It felt very quiet and lonely to him. Um, yeah, the composition of the family, as I said, did they arrive in a big family? Did they live with a, with a bachelor? Did they live with an elderly couple? Then um, whether they were allowed to stay with their siblings, if there were siblings, if they had traveled together, in about half of the cases, the siblings were separated. Um, Agnes, who I will talk about more later, she she had her little brother with her. So, and that that the ones who were with the siblings kind of had a sense of stability, a sense of continuity, somebody to talk to. Uh, whereas some of the others who were separated from their siblings felt very lonely. And there's one beautiful example where Theodore whose picture you'll also see later on, was reunited with his brother, Tony, after 60 years of not being in touch because people literally were not in contact anymore. It was, there wasn't always, people did not know where the other sibling ended up in, basically. Another factor is um, the children tended to feel better if they were in touch with their German family, even if it was only the occasional letter, but there was, again, continuity, stability. There were people caring for me. Um, then there were the, the motives of the Irish families were also very different. Um, the positive motives were just, they wanted to do good, they wanted to, share what they have. I think the Irish have a genetic disposition to sharing in the first place. So some of them just wanted to help these poor children. And for instance, um, Friedhelm Krötz's father learned German for him. Um, Helmut Erb's foster mother, she had prepared a jigsaw puzzle for their very first meeting because she realized, I don't speak a word of German. This little kid won't speak a word of English. So where can we meet? How can we bond? And, and Elizabeth has always said her foster mother, when she arrived, she had knitted her all sorts of you know pretty little dresses and sweaters. And she just felt so welcome you know, for the very first time in her life because she grew up in several orphanages and nobody had ever prepared a loving home for her. Um, another way, yeah, and then you had the unfortunate cases where the motives 
were either, I would say, practical, people needed help on the farm, or in the very rare cases, even motivated by revenge. One lady took in a German boy. She had lost her husband during the war. She hated the Germans and she, she hit him. She just, I mean, she, she abused the, her foster child. What also helped, uh, and this also ties into economic stability, is if the child did not have to change families. Several kids were moved on to another family, in some cases, even several families. Sometimes it wasn't the choice of the family, like uh, in Herbert Remmel's case, his first foster family, uh, the, the foster father lost his job. They, they couldn't afford to keep the German child anymore. And in other cases, they just found that the kid was not really housebroken. Um, we, I, we, I'll talk about Klaus Foster, Klaus Armstrong Brown in more detail later. He had lived in orphanages all his life. He simply did not know how to use a fork and a knife. And he ended up, his first family, they didn't teach him English first. They took him to French lessons. But they were shocked that this child had no manners. And they passed him on. And Klaus ended up in 13 foster families. Uh, yeah, which has, which really traumatized him. So in conclusion, most families were exceptionally loving. And this you can also tell because many of my interviewees refer to their <laughs> Irish parents as Irish mommy and daddy, or they talk about their Irish brothers and sisters. They, in a sense, they, they have two families. Um, and some kids just, you know, had rotten luck. They did not uh, come to happy surroundings when they, they were moved to Ireland. Yeah, any questions? Yes. Amy. Amy? Yes, please. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks for this um, fascinating input. I just have a question. You mentioned that some children came from German orphanages. Why wasn't it decided to just take children from orphanages? Like that would have maybe also been an, I an idea because I mean, they didn't have any parents at all or any family at all. I don't know whether you have come across anything to answer that. Um, I cannot give you, honestly, I don't know. It's an interesting thought because, yeah, then you wouldn't have had this question of, um, yeah, returning and everything. Um, I think lots of the German families that were chosen for Operation Shamrock um, were equally were in, a, in an equally bad situation. Uh, one family had 13 children. The mother was alone with her 13 children. The Jugendamt, the, the state said, um, you know, either they go to orphanages or you pick some to send to Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, most families, either there were one parent families or they, they were, instable families. I don't think many, many kids were taken from families where everything was more or less all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another question by Anne-Sophie Horno. Yes, please. Yeah, <clears throat> hello. Um, you kind of touched on this, uh, but I was just uh, curious as to whether um, there was any kind of supervision going on um, in between, so next to transferring kids to other families, of course, if there were any issues, um, but if there was any kind of supervision at all, it was probably yes. difficult to manage, but. As I said, not in a systematic way. 
uh, the, the kids who lived in Dublin, they were visited by people from this uh, Save the German Children Society. But even in that case, I wonder, um, this little kid who has arrived in Ireland, who's still not fluent in English, uh, you know, somebody walks into the home and in front of their the host parents says, are you happy in this family? I mean, what are they supposed to say under these circumstances, right? And in other cases, like in Klaus's case, nobody was asked for permission. He was just passed on from one family to the next family. And I think the people tried to find suitable families, like very often they involved the village priest. But yeah, it didn't always work out for the best. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then I'll go on. A question by Edward. Yes. Yes, Edward. Yes, thank you. And thank you again for this um, really um, eye-opening and fascinating uh, uh, presentation and lecture. Um, um, I have many questions, but I'll, uh, I, there are two in particular that I'll, I'm interested in. Um, first is, um, did the parents know in advance that uh, that the siblings uh, or their children, the siblings would be divided or separated? Did they did they know that that could that would be a possibility? That's my first question. And then the second is, did any of your um, I guess your interviewee or your interviews or your, the participants keep any like letters or documents uh, from their parents? that um, you were able to perhaps have access to? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think really the German parents or the, in many cases, the single parent, the mother, uh, did, know, did not know a lot. Like in only very rare cases, they were giving, given the name of the family and the composition of the family. There was an exception. I think they told their kids, you must stay together. Whatever happens, by all means, stay together. And this really showed in scenes that they shared with me, uh, like in Grand Cree, as I said, the selection process, which was rather odd. They, they were small children, so they put them on tables. And one, one girl and her brother were holding hands, and the girl, had already a foster family was already interested in the girl and she just refused to let go of her brother's hand. So in the end, the foster family's late mother's sister said, oh, come on, I'll take the boy. And, and they were living house to house. So the kids were in close contact, but it was pure chance. Um, and your second question, Edward, um, yes, they, many of them have saved all the letters, all the letters uh, then went back and forth between the families that also in some cases went back about their adoption processes, every scrap of newspaper. Um, this is their identity. And to many of them, it is more this having been part of Operation Shamar is more important than anything else that ever happened in their lives. Elizabeth O'Gorman, who I'll talk more about later, she, she saved her little sweater, the one she was wearing on the boat when she first came to Ireland. She, when she gave her speeches in Ireland, she always arrived with her little sweater. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, then I will move on. Um, what are the long-term influences of Operation Shamrock? And here I'm fully aware that I'm talking about a very limited database because uh, if there were 450 children and I only talked to 20 plus of them, this is a selection, obviously. And I also have the suspicion, and in some cases I know that people 
I, I know one lady whose brother was in another family. He was, she was very happy with her family. Her brother was very unhappy with his family for various reasons. He started drinking at a very early age and he was dead by the age of 22 or 25, sorry. So I suspect that, that the ones who I was able to interview in general had a more positive outlook on life, took better care of themselves. Um, but this is again, speculation. But so what are the long-term influences? Um, I think everybody who was part of Operation Shamrock was really involved with the question of what constitutes identity. Is it your native language? Is it your nationality? Is it your core family? Um, most of the ones who returned to Germany said in the interviews they felt partially Irish. In, and we're talking after 50 years, right? And they're still saying, yes, I'm partially, I feel partially Irish and I'm proud of it. And uh, the ones who continued living in Ireland, they said, with the exception of one interview, they said they felt Irish. You know, German identity was completely erased. In a good sense, the ones who, who viewed their experience as positive, um, they said their identity had become broader and richer by the experience. They were allowed to have a double identity. They were allowed to have two families at the same time. And uh, one of them, for instance, talked about Christmas. Um, I think in general, Christmas in Ireland tends to be a bit more joyful and in Germany, it's maybe a bit more sentimental. And the, the guy said, hey, I had both, you know? I had the, 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 the joyful Irish Christmas, but I also got to sing some sad German Christmas songs. Um, and some feel, and again, this may also be compounded by other biographical experience. It says, uh, for instance, that they were orphaned at a very young age or that they were moved from one foster family to the next, that they were never allowed to develop a healthy and stable sense of belonging, of identity. Um, I think what it also promoted Operation Shamrock was like a grassroots connection between the two countries. Um, most of the people who went back to Germany as um, always kept in touch with their families. They moved back and forth. They went to each other's weddings and baptisms and funerals uh, also by now. Um, the people I interviewed, as I mentioned before, have a keen interest in Operation Shamrock. They're eager to talk about their experiences. When I organize these exhibitions, I always get to um, to invite two time witnesses and I have to keep a list because they're fighting. They want to come each and every time. So I have to, uh, you know, make sure that I, you know, give them their fair share of um, public appearances. Um, many of them have a big, big, big sense of gratitude and paying forward. You can also say that uh, many of them picked jobs where they could pass on their what they lived through. Like you have nurses, you have a child therapist, you have lots of volunteer work uh, amongst those. Agnes, she, for instance, she is very involved with refugee work. Um, the language barrier was never really a problem. Most people said, um, and indeed in having English as a second language proved useful for many of them later on in their lives. Uh, but also in, in quite a few of them, they never, they never really warmed to school. Um, many only started school at the age of eight or nine. 
and never really developed an academic interest. Many had not gone to school in Germany at all and only started school in Ireland. Um, yeah, so I'm about to move on to the individual stories, but I'm very happy to take questions again in the meantime. Okay, then um, I will go into the individual stories. This is Klaus Armstrong Brown. As you can see, he was born in 1940. He was born to a German father and a Polish mother, and he never knew his father. He was conscripted into the army and, and was gone. And I think also, was not he was not admitted to, into his German family and the Polish mother put him into an orphanage at a very early age. Um, he only saw his mother twice and then she she was uh, her she apparently she lived in a rail railroad carriage and that carriage was bombed and she was dead and so already in Germany, he had lived in several orphanages. And then he is the one who was passed on to 13 families. His, fa his first family, they were, I, he says they were friendly people, but they, I will, I will actually, I will read a quote. Um, the first home in which I was placed, the Woodworth, was not too bad. But I caused them problems because I could not speak their language and I wet the bed. I remember their daughter looking after me, which was, but the family could not cope with me, so I had to leave. Then he was uh, passed on to the family of uh, Bob and Fanny Armstrong, and they loved him. It was an elderly couple, but they loved him and he loved them dearly. Uh, he loved them so dearly that he later adopted their name, uh, Armstrong Brown is, uh, the, he, he was Klaus Brown and he adopted Daddy Armstrong's name. Um, they lived on a farm and they took him fishing. And um, I don't know, he had, he had a good time with the animals. And he also, as a young child, even because he didn't have much, Klaus was a very religious child. So for him coming into a very religious, family was also perfect. Um, then, of course, because they were elderly, um, unfortunately, they couldn't take care of him anymore. And uh, he was passed on to the next family. And, and I, again, I quote, throughout the next 12 pla placements, I had no loving environment, but only loneliness and abuse at times. I was bullied at school. Made fun of. Uh, once my supposed guardian, who was too fond of alcohol, tried to kill me with a pitchfork through my neck, but I managed to get my neck between the tines. I had no one to complain or to talk to about my problems. So uh, all his life has, Klaus's life has really been a struggle for identity and a place of belonging. He is, he calls himself a stray dog. And it's um, also, he tries to enlist the people, uh, the help of people in finding his family. He has tried to send several people that have met him throughout the years to Poland to research his mother's family, but there's really only a name to go on by. So nothing has ever come out of that. I have maybe 300 emails of Clausens. He's also writing a book about his life. This is what he does. Okay, so this is Klaus. Any questions about Klaus in particular? Okay. Yeah, I have some pictures. Um, to the left, this was his first family at the Dublin Zoo, and then his nice 
life at Daddy Armstrong's farm. Oh yes, he also, he believes he had a brother, Willie, who was separated from him. But from all the data I got from him and I have you know, several documents, I've not been able to verify that Klaus indeed was his brother and there's no trace of him. This is a sad story. Yeah, then he was at the age of 14. Nobody knows why, he, he's the last person to know. He was sent to, to the UK. He actually uh, uh, then lived in Chester um, at Dr. Bernardo's and he still lives in the Chester area. This is Hildegard, who I will not talk about today. She stayed in Ireland and she, yeah, she also, she, she had a tough life in Germany. Her life in Ireland then turned out for the better. Um, she met her mother once, her German mother once in the 1970s. But apparently she was a woman of doubtful character, so they never warmed to each other or kept in contact much. This is Herbert. Herbert is the sunshine of the group. Herbert um, has such a positive outlook on life. He uh, was, first he lived in Dublin with a family he really liked. And then um, they, the guy lost his job. He was back at the orphanage. And this lady walked in and said, hey, I need somebody to to come to County Mayo and help Granny out on the farm. And the, the guy he had been living with before, he, he, had, he, he had told him about how Mayo is like the place you don't want to live in, especially not at the time, the poor house of Ireland. Uh, and then also to help grandmother on the farm. But Herbert said, yes, I want to live on a farm. I've never lived on a farm before. So he, he moved to Mayo and I interviewed three of his friends from back then. He was the local hero. In a very remote part of the country, he had news of the world. He talked to, to the kids, but also to the adults about, uh, uh, I don't know, like German airplanes. And uh, I mean, he, he so very quickly understood that Irish gift of the gap to just talk about what has happened to you and you know say hi to everybody and share and he interestingly enough he moved to east germany when west germany um uh remilitarized after the war so he was um behind the iron curtain till the war came down till the wall came down sorry but then he quickly reestablished contact with his Irish friends and family and he's he's one of the I would say closest to his Irish buddies still he tries to go over every year unfortunately at his age they don't allow him to rent a car anymore so he must now enlist the help of his son if he wants to go over yeah great guy lives near Schwerin has an open house. If any of you ever wants to drop by, um, Herbert is happy to talk about Operation Shamrock at all times with everybody. This is Agnes. Agnes, um, I, I call the perfect child. Oh. She was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1936. Um, she was the oldest of three children and her father spoke out against Adolf Hitler so he was sent away to the war his mother her mother was alone with three children and uh, they they were evacuated when they moved back to Würselen which is somewhere in North Rhine-Westphalia the town was uh, destroyed and it, 1946 was the year of the worst famine because um Oh, the fields were mined. People had not uh, taken care of the fields. The guy, the the men were uh, in the war. The women had been moved. So it was a terrible year. And 
Agnes' young brother was offered uh, a place with Operation Shamrock. And the mother said, if he goes, you're going to. She wasn't asked, she was sent, which was quite usual, I think, at the time. You didn't really ask for children's opinions. You tell them what happens. And um, I think Agnes's mother, she, they were also a very religious family, and she, she knew she had to, she could not go on feeding three children. It was beyond her, and the priest said it's an Catholic country, they will be good to them, send, send your kids to Ireland if you can, send two if you can. But many people in that small town of Würselen called her, it's a German term, a Rabenmutter, like they, call, they said, you're a bad mother. They actually spat out in front of her because uh, it was not considered okay for a German mother. There had been a big cult about being a German mother to send your children away to a foreign country. Um, she, she had a lovely stay in Ireland, but she was maybe, she, she always said, I mean, she's described as the perfect child. She, she always volunteered uh, to help out. She was knitting all the time underwear for herself and her brother in her village, school or in, in the small town school she went to, they had never heard of homework. It wasn't customary in Ireland at the time. So Agnes told the teacher that in Germany, she was very used to uh, having to do homework every day. And the teacher said, great idea. We'll establish this here as well. And of course, the kids weren't happy about that at all. But Agnes let them all copy her notes before school. So she, she had a really hard time going back to Germany because she felt very attached to her host family, but um, she also felt very attached to her family back in Germany. Um, in the beginning, when they returned to Germany, the children would still get up in the morning to scavenge for food because this was her Germany, the Germany she knew. And the mother said, no, no, you stay in and then you go to school. She would have left to become a doctor, but because the family was still so dirt poor in Germany at the time, she, um, she had to work in a, fa in a factory at first, but later on she trained to become a nurse. And she's the one who's really involved uh, with refugee work. Um, okay, the next one. Ah, oh, yeah, this is uh, Agnes and her brother Karl. And uh, in an old, an old picture that was reprinted in the Irish Daily Mail in 2013. And another picture of her in 1947. This is Rita. Rita Kuhl was a lovely person who I've met at several of the uh, exhibition openings. And um, he, he's a very smart guy. He had a lovely Irish family. Um, he never took to school. So all his Irish siblings went on to university and he was, he was a worker at first. He, he was sent back to Germany in 1955. In 1949, when he was supposed to send, uh, you know, return to Germany, his family, which was really big, uh, the circumstances weren't deemed stable enough yet. So he was kept until 1955. And it was very hard for him to return to Germany in 1955. And he didn't speak any German at all anymore at the time. So he, I think he could have really done something brilliant with his life. And it's a bit of a shameful issue that he never got a college degree because, especially because all his Irish siblings are very successful people. But he doesn't, he's such a kind hearted person. He also doesn't hold a grudge. Um, yeah, that's the Cotter family, his siblings at the time. They, I interviewed his foster sister and his foster brother, Michael and Jacqueline, and they also say he's family. 
He's one of us. He fit in perfectly. <laughs> yeah. The picture from 1955 when Friedhelm was sent back to Germany. Mm. Yeah, this is Hans-Peter Boden. Oh, any questions? No? Um, yeah, this is Hans-Peter Boden. He was born in 1939 and um, he, his mother, he was from a well-to-do family in Germany. For his mother, it wasn't easy to take care of Hans-Peter and his sister during the war. Um, and then after the war, his father, who had not been a supporter of Hitler, he was given the task to, to uh, create a city government in northern Germany. So the family was briefly reunited. And then it was decided that Hans Peter and his sister would be sent to Ireland. And for him, it was a very, he never understood why his parents decided to send the children over to Ireland, especially since they were not a poor family. Uh, and he has been traumatized. Uh, he, he is traumatized by, by this fact to the very day. I think every time I've talked to him about Operation Shamrock, he's actually started crying. And so I think for him, this also tainted his Irish experience. He was unhappy from, from the very beginning, although the first family that Hans and Heidi stayed with, they were actually friends of his parents from before the war. So it wasn't even complete strangers, but Hans never got over being separated from his mother and the father he had just re he met very briefly after the war. Interestingly enough, his sister Heidi took, uh, she had a completely different experience. She was younger. She didn't question the fact so much. And she was everybody, she became everybody's darling in Ireland. And she describes, this, describes her stay in Ireland as a very happy circumstance in her life. Yeah, he became a child therapist because he said, uh, yeah, you ha just have to be at the side of children who live through very bad situations and they're, they're helpless and somebody has to be the advocate. Yeah, but Hans and Heidi, date unknown. Mm -hmm. Oops, wrong direction. This is Elizabeth O'Gorman. Um, she, she was actually born Lily Kohlberg in 1938. And she, uh, she organized the first gathering of the children of Operation Shamrock, uh, which was in the 90s. So really all of this is, uh, has partly been made possible by her. She um, had a twin brother and three older siblings and her father was away in the war and her mother became very ill. And so the younger children, Elizabeth and her brother were sent to an orphanage at a very early um, child uh, age. I'm sorry, and I quote here, Elizabeth says, I remember mom taking, being taken away in an ambulance and I never saw her again. I can't remember what she looked like and there are no pictures because the house was bombed later on. So they were already in a succession of orphanages in Germany. And uh, then they, their aunt who had custody of them after the war, sent them to Ireland. And I think it wasn't neither Elizabeth or Gottfried, her brother, were so much shocked by the fact because 
because for them, it was just, you know, another orphanage. They didn't care whether it was in Germany or in Ireland or in Belgium. It didn't mean anything to them either. They were kids. But um, in fact, on the boat, some of the older children told Elizabeth that they weren't being sent to Ireland. They were being sent to, to a slaughterhouse that the Tommies, as the British people were called back then, were taking revenge on the German children and they were all being sent to a slaughterhouse and little Elizabeth believed them. Uh, yeah, but then um, I think from day one in Ireland, everything worked out for her. She, she uh, had the luck of falling into a very, very loving family, also a well-to-do family, and they loved her and they took good care of her. And in the beginning, she had a difficult time in school, she says, as the, they, the, the Irish kids would call her sausage head. And, uh, but she didn't, she, she was able to protect herself. She, uh, uh, what? She, I would wrestle the kids down and make them say Heil Hitler. Nobody was going to look down on me. Um, she wasn't that interested in school either, but she uh, became a great athlete. She was the Irish senior champ in tennis and she got married to an Irish guy, had five children and many, many, many grandchildren. And in fact, she died rather peacefully on the tennis court in the arms of her long-term husband. Yeah, she's a beautiful human being, Elizabeth. This is a picture from 1946 with her family. And you can, even just this little bad black and white picture tells you with how much love they look down on little Elizabeth, right? Yeah. Yeah, she died in 2017. Yeah, this is it as to the children. And very briefly, I would like to talk about, um, I would like to contrast the impressions that the uh, that the, the German children had in comparison to their Irish foster brothers and sisters and friends. When I went to interview them, I kind of assumed that Operation Shamrock would be as important to the Irish people as it was to their, as it is to their German counterparts. And they feel very happy that they met these Germans and that they've kept in touch and they like I say, Herbert Remmel still is the local hero in uh, in in uh, what's the name of it? I can't remember the name of the little town now. It's uh, in Ma Mayo somewhere, uh, but it hasn't t influenced their lives to the same degree. I would say there's maybe also a certain glorification of these little Germans that lived with them for a couple of years. Um, he was such a fast learner, they say. He was so city-wise. And later, he, she became truly Irish. Um, apart from that, they noticed an accent and maybe also a certain fear in their German counterparts. Like uh, when, when uh, Fintan Coleman was telling me that every time his little foster sister saw a plane, uh, she would dive under the table. So he noticed as a child that something must have happened to her, but he didn't realize that she was really just, you know, very fearful, very traumatized from having grown up with bombers at a very young age. Um, but all in all, they say they seemed like normal children to them. They couldn't have said at the time that they were different or, or seemed particularly odd or anything. Um, and 
some, I talked to one Irish lady whose family had a German foster child. The guy went home and they never heard from him again. And I mean, she was not, she was not holding a grudge, but she still said, well, we've always wondered what had become of him and he seemed to be happy with us. And it's kind of odd that he just left us for good. Yeah. This is the part about the children and Operation Shamrock in general. I could read you one of the short stories and we could go on and have a discussion afterwards or we can have a discussion now, whatever you like. I think it's better to have it afterwards if you want to show us some something else like bits of the short stories okay mm -hmm. then I'll grab the book um why why did i write the short story so i can tell you um when i interviewed the people i i, I told you i had to stick to a formal structure to to somehow canalize the information but behind the facts, I always heard a child speaking to me, you know, the awe of the first orange that they ever tasted, the, the loss of a shoe, the loss of a shoe meant so much. One guy, they were bombed out, but in the same night, he had lost one of his two shoes and losing a shoe in a wartime situation for him was so much bigger than losing his home. That was what stuck with him. The, the losing his home was, you know, he realized later on what this meant, but his shoe was stuck in his mind. So um, I, I thought I wanted to, I took one incident from the children's stories and I, I fictionalized the event. So in some cases you can probably tell from the bio, uh, who I am talking about, but it's really I did something else to their story. So I would say it's not their story anymore, but it's kind of a, new, a universal story, a story of what does family mean, what does loneliness mean, what does um, solidarity mean from a ch child's point of view, and. I think this makes their experience more tangible and at the same time more true. It transports another truth that is not uh, part of the formal interviews, I would say. So some stories are kind of sad. When I first read them on Echo Island, people in the audience were crying. Um, and I, I take this as a good sign because they were moved by the stories. But for you, I've chosen one of the happier stories. And I will read you the story of girl number eight. Now, I have not included their names in the stories because, as I explained, I think this is a more universal experience that I'm describing. The little girl on the narrow dirt path is approaching a thick patch of brambles. She steps forward and begins to pick the fat black berries. She is very careful because she is afraid of the thorns and doesn't want her new blouse to rip. Full of delight, she stuffs her mouth with the fruit and doesn't notice how the purple juice begins to leave marks on her face and on her hands and even starts to trickle down her chin and onto her blouse. When she feels that she can't possibly eat any more berries, she continues her slow journey. It is nearly noon and she can feel the sun on her arms and on her legs. When she comes to a fork in the road, she hesitates for a second before she chooses the lane to the right. To her left, she, she sees a group of sheep. She walks on. Sometime later, she arrives at a hedge. She spots a little brownish bird that flutters around in circles, chirping away. She starts telling the bird about her plan and even digs around in her bundle for the letter that states that she is seven years old, that she is a Catholic girl, and that she has had the measles. 
before she can show it to the bird, it flies away. Now the road is winding downhill towards a farmhouse, which she thinks she recognizes. She came up with her plan yesterday. All of the children had been picked up by Irish families to be taken home for Sunday dinner. Her family was a group of big and ruddy-faced people with open smiles. Of course, she couldn't understand what they were saying to her, but they seemed friendly. During the meal, she had torn some bread into pieces, rolled these pieces into tiny balls, and stuffed them into her pocket. When the huge man walked over and motioned for her to give him the bread balls, she thought she would be in trouble, maybe even receive a beating. Instead, he put the balls on the table and spread a big chunk of butter on a slice of bread, which he handed to her. She had been so happy that day to be out in the countryside, chasing after the kittens and watching the workhouses. Best of all, she had loved the big, white, majestic geese. When the family walked her back to the children's home at the end of the day, she had decided that she wanted to live on this farm with these big strangers. She had paid special attention to the road and memorized as many details as possible. On their way back, they had first gone up a hill towards some big trees, then in the direction of a herd of sheep, they had crossed a meadow full of wildflowers, then went straight on for a long time, past the bramble patch and towards the first houses of the village and onto the door of the children's home. Today, just after breakfast, when the other kids were cleaning the tables, she had put her change of clothes into a bundle together with the important letter and it snuck out of the back door. And now she is on her way. She starts skipping along, brimming with excitement. Suddenly, fear jolts through her body. The sheep she saw before, or were these the same sheep she saw yesterday? Should she have chosen the road to the left? What if she gets lost? Or if she... What if the smiling strangers won't be smiling anymore today? if she even ever reaches them in the first place. A tear trickles down her cheek, smudging the traces of the blackberry juice. The little girl is thirsty now. She sighs. She sits down. What can she do? There is no turning back. She gets up and marches on. She spots a woman with a basket walking towards her. As she gets closer, the little girl recognizes her. She is the woman who had carried the big pot of steaming food to the table yesterday. Now she's standing right in front of the little girl, a big smile spreading on her face. What are you doing here, Cricket? She says in a tender and slightly incredulous voice. So. This was one of the 18 short stories. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. welcome. Do you now want to, to get into the discussion or um, what are you planning? <laughs> um, well, I'm very happy to take more questions because I think this is such a big topic that I'm sure, yeah, Edwidge, you have a question. No, it's an old hand. Now your hand is gone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not oh, 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 okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Looks You're similar. Welcome. Yeah. So first yeah. of all, thank you very much for this more than interesting talk. I think uh, the questions already told you that it is a very interesting field that you deal with. And I think we should open the floor for questions. The next um 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I would actually like to start. Uh, with a very basic question, what made you do research in this field? So how did that develop that you um, first started with these interviews and then as a follow-up wrote the short stories? So what, what made you um, curious about this field? Um, 
I think I've always been very curious about people who grow up in different cultures and what constitutes a sense of identity. And then I, when I heard these stories at Glen Cree, I just thought this is so fascinating. What have these people gone through and how differently have they responded to what happened to them? What were the different factors that influenced their perceptions? And then it, it became very easy because, um, as I said before, the, these, these time witnesses are so willing to share their stories, were so willing to share their stories with me. And with lots of them, I'm still in regular touch. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yes, so a very personal motivation actually mm -hmm. yeah thank you are there any other questions well i think if i may if i may um, add another sentence maria i think it's both personal and professional because i my, my grandmother also lived through the war and hers is also a very interesting story for instance she lot my mom never met her father he died in the war before she um she was born, uh, she, my grandmother then later on became the, the lover of a Russian officer and which in a sense was rape, but he also saved her from the other soldiers. And I, I always, as a child, I tried to get my grandmother to talk about her wartime experiences and about her life. And she, she wasn't always happy to talk to me, but she, she talked to me and I actually interviewed her. Uh, when I was 20. And this was one of the reasons I decided to study history. So, and history is for me, like philosophy, on a practical level, what influences people's lives? What are your what which personal choices can you make? And where do you where are you just part of some big political circus that is happening around you? Mm -hmm. Yes, like something that is happening now at the moment in the Ukraine. So uh, I see lots of similarities, actually, because people uh, live quite a, a normal, regular life. And now they all have to, to leave the country, are refugees and live in poverty, do not have heating or food. And it's, it's horrible. Yeah, you're totally right. Thank you. Ina, you have a question. Yes, thank you very much, Monica, for that talk. It's um, it's so interesting, I think. There's so many, many um, roads we could go down to uh, with with questions. My questions, um, uh, my question is is mainly about um, you know the relationship between you know your factual research and the fictional um, writing of the text, which is. Uh, because I've, I'm, I'm teaching a class and some of my students are here on transatlantic life writing. And um, we're, we're looking on at uh, autobiographies, but we are lo also looking at biofiction. So for the last two weeks or so, we've been concerned with this issue of, you know, truth. Um, and, and you said something along those lines, I would really want you to elaborate on that, that you can also convey a certain kind of truth through fiction. Is that what you were saying? And can you maybe say more about the relationship between, you know, this, this more, what I, what I would call more journalistic uh, historian's work on the one hand, and then the artist writer's work on the other hand that you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, I don't know if I can say more about it. I'll try. <laughs> I, I think that if you if you condense an experience or it, and transform an experience uh, even to make it more understandable by by an audience, then you're you're imparting another kind of truth. You're imparting a truth. Behind, beyond the facts, because people can relate to the experiences of a child, perhaps in another matter, then they could, I don't know if you, I mean, I, I personally, 
I, I love this little st the story and it's a true story. I mean, I've changed a lot, but it's a true story that a seven year old girl decides to walk back to the family where she had dinner and she could have gotten lost a million times on that way, right? Trying to um, remember the bamboo patch is not really that useful or, or going by the sheep she saw yesterday. Um, but it's, I mean, this is, this is what I think people can relate to, to, to the essence that is condensed in this wish of the little girl. Does yeah. this satisfy yeah, thank you? you very much. Yes, thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm sure that uh, you need to tell me more about the class you're teaching. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and actually, I've done this uh, at the University of Galway. I have asked people to come up with a part of their own life mm -hmm. and turn it into a little story. Yeah, I mean, we're reading um, uh, Frank McCord's Angela's Ashes, and we're reading it alongside Colm Tobin's Brooklyn. So that, mm -hmm. that's kind of the, 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 the diversity of the text we're looking at. And of course, the fact, fact fiction divide, which I think is not really a divide. I'd say it's more of a continuum um, on which we find these different genres. And, yes. Uh, so, so I totally agree with you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. I also have another question. Um, are you carrying on with interviewing people or uh, is, it, is it difficult probably to find more? Um, yes, I. it's funny how I, I usually, I, yes, I have two more in the pipeline at this very moment. It's For me, it's not always easy to do this at the side because I have to go to Ireland and I have to make time for that. But there are more people related to Operation Shamrock than have been known so far. And I would love to uh, capture all their stories because we're talking about people in their 80s. You know, at some point, these stories will be lost. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is why I'm asking, actually, because it, it, it is probably becoming more and more difficult to find people. Lots of them are probably ill or have died already. So might be tricky to get uh, addresses or people to, who are willing to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, some of them have died, some of them have dementia. So yes, it is getting more difficult and the numbers have dwindled. Even from the ones I interviewed, uh, several have passed on or are not in a state where they can travel and talk about their experiences anymore. Mm -hmm. And probably those who went there pretty young, maybe at the age of, what was the, the beginning? I forgot, uh, around four. Five, um, five-ish, yeah. They might, they might have uh, forgotten what it was like because they were too young and just have, I don't know, <laughs> sort of a memory. Here, here again, I, I would uh, you know, refer back to what Ina said. I think um, you, you, if something like Operation has champ uh, shamrock has happened in your life uh, this is so life defining that mm. everybody still has memories and the memories in many cases have also become fictionalized in their mm -hmm. stories because they've talked about their own stories so many times mm -hmm. and i think this is a, a normal psychological thing that memories overlap with what you interpret what you put into yes. it this is Definitely. something that, that happens to, to everybody. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yes, um, very interesting. Uh, are there any other questions maybe from the students? Also quiet. Yes, Bianca. Yeah, an aspect that I found very interesting because you mentioned um, that some of them were very traumatized and it's like, it's not an individual trauma, it's in collective trauma, but how did you deal with that? Um, because probably it was also hard to talk to them and see how it triggers their trauma again. Um, or how did they deal with it? Um, well, I guess um, being a Gestalt therapist, having uh, training in that field kind of 
help me. Um, I certainly never forced anybody to share uh, anything they didn't want to share. Like I would always respect their their their. Some some said like I will talk to you, but I don't want my name published because I don't want to know the public uh, that to know that I was raped. Um, and I've, yeah, I've listened to sad stories. I've listened to happy stories. And I think that has a therapeutic um, effect in itself. I think it helps people to share what they went through with a, somebody who does not interpret or judge or in any way interfere with what they went through. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and thank, you. thank you. Some, some Klaus Armstrong bound for he's it's interesting also because I mean he he claims he came over to Ireland in 1944. I know this is not, not possible, but I've never contradicted him because I mean you cannot tell these are their stories, and I have never told anybody. Well, this is not very possible. I don't believe you here, but I've always you know taken whatever they said about their experience as their experience and I've also said in my book that I cannot claim accuracy for everything that they told me because in some cases the facts have clearly been distorted in their memories mm -hmm. yes yeah I think it's difficult to, say, to to tell them no it was not like that mm -hmm. <laughs> that would destroy everything in a way wouldn't it yes yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again. I, I think we there aren't any further questions as far as I can see it here. I don't see all of your pictures, but most of them. So thank you again for this en enlightening and great talk. I think everybody enjoyed listening to you uh, and to the stories uh, you told us of uh, the people in the pictures here. Um, so. Um, Yes, I think we uh, finish here with our lecture. And for my students, we just meet regularly in our seminar room next Thursday at the same time. So thank you all for participating, for your questions, for joining us and discuss, uh, discussing lively. And uh, yes, I, I hope to see many of you in our next online talk by Michel Zirkel, who is also here today. So bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure for us.